Good local time, everyone. My name is Audrey Tang, and I'm Taiwan's digital minister. It is a genuine pleasure to participate in the Puzong Anti-Corruption Festival alongside leading academics, activists, experts, and politicians striving to stop corruption and promote transparency across all segments of our free and open societies. Before sharing my thoughts on how Taiwan can help build a world without corruption, while strengthening democracy and digital resilience, I wish to first congratulate President Kaputova on her clear-eyed address yesterday. We now have more food for thought to digest while addressing global societal issues and advancing the greater good. Taiwan, like our good friend Slovakia, is committed to combating corruption in all shapes and forms. The government is leaving no stone unturned in getting to grips with this slippery issue. For example, our Anti-Corruption Act takes a tough line on civil servants who fall foul of the law. And the Ministry of Justice Agency Against Corruption is doing very impressive work in ensuring that Taiwan continues along the path to achieving clean and competent governance, transparency, and harmonization of our local laws and practices with international standards. A central plank in this process is steadily implementing the UN Convention Against Corruption, as well as innovative initiatives such as the Agency Against Corruption's Integrity Award and Integrity Volunteers, heightening public awareness of anti-corruption via civic engagement. Our national report on implementation of the convention makes for heartening reading, and I strongly recommend seeking out the document on the Ministry of Justice website for a drill down on Taiwan's progress. And I'm pleased to say that Taiwan's tireless toil is paying handsome dividends. In the latest Corruption Perception Index published by Transparency International, Taiwan is now the 25th in the world, our highest rank since the first CPI was released in 1995. And in Transparency International's Government Defense Integrity Index, Taiwan shares an invariable low risk rating with fellow members of the free world, including Belgium, Germany, Latvia, the Netherlands, Norway, Switzerland, and the UK. Now, Taiwan is coming along in leaps and bounds in the anti corruption sphere, but we cannot afford to rest on our laurels. My ministry, the Ministry of Digital Affairs, or MODA, fully supports Ministry of Justice efforts. The MODA is busy bolstering people-public-private partnerships aimed at fostering an ethical and clean administrative, business, and political environment. And this is in keeping with the MODA's core mission of delivering digital resilience for all which is to quickly recover from adversity, to adapt and learn from the experience. I touch upon the benefits of this all-hands-on-deck approach during my address at last month's Summit for Democracy, also joined by President Kaputova. A key takeaway from the second edition of this game-changing event is that Russia's illegal and unprovoked war of aggression against Ukraine is bringing democracies together in adapting to a dramatically reshaped geopolitical reality. An integral part of this process involves breathing new life into democracy so as to meet the socio-economic demands of the 21st century. Yet another action is creating the conditions for all segments of society to make real and lasting contribution to democratic processes. This embrace of borderless collaboration was one of my hopes when signing the Declaration for the Future of the Internet in 2022, along with the representatives of Slovakia and over 60 partner countries. The Declaration cements our common values of freedom, democracy, respect for human rights and rule of law, as well as deepens a collective commitment to realizing the potential of the digital realm with full respect for data privacy, security and sustainability. The internet should not be a platform of fear and loathing utilized by authoritarians to crack down 
on civil liberties and personal freedoms. Rather, it should be a platform of freedom and enlightenment in which all opinions are heard and can enrich democratic debate and dialogue. In the face of authoritarian expansionism, democracies must confront formidable challenges, undermining the delicate equilibrium between societal well-being and individual freedoms. Our efforts need to go beyond devising protective measures. We need to envision a trajectory embracing the triad of participation, progress, and safety through the power of collective intelligence. And this approach is embodied in the MODA's overarching vision, plurality, technologies enabling collaborative diversity. When people from all walks of life can form digital public spaces together, it is now possible to empower the voices reaching across ideological divides to uncover our shared values in plain sight. It is essential to harness the power of plurality and build a future where technology and democracy can support one another for the benefit of all. And a crucial step is to revitalize our collective intelligence systems, which includes global governance institutions, large companies, standard-setting organizations, courts, and decision-making structures within universities, startups, and nonprofits. And these democratic institutions have achieved great things, but their inflexibility often prevents them from effectively serving humankind and cooperating to tackle global challenges like climate change, disinformation, and pandemics. And now, transformative technologies such as AI and the Internet have the potential to change the long-term direction of civilization and affect countless lives. So to solve the participation progress safety trilemma needs new approach to set priorities guided by informed, deliberative decisions focused on the spirit of plurality, collaborative diversity. As we confront the competing incentives between progress, safety, and participation, consideration must be given to the construction of collectively intelligent institutions for developing and deploying transformative technology. I envision this path through collective intelligence. We can navigate the delicate balance of trade-offs, of material outcomes, and state-of-the-art information can be our roadmap rather than our predetermined assumptions. Constant evaluation and improvement of these systems is necessary to ensure they remain fair, transparent, and genuinely representative of the diverse values and needs of those they serve. And by surfacing and naming those concerns and emphasizing adaptability, the solution can function as a comprehensive and effective approach to fostering civic engagement and mitigating polarization. Depolarization is actually the essential ingredient in keeping global anti-corruption efforts on the fast track. So in closing, I wish to take this opportunity to sincerely thank Slovakia and other like-minded partners across Europe and around the world to choosing to stand with Taiwan. Your high-profile support at this testing time is truly treasured and touches the heart of Taiwan's 23 million freedom and democracy-loving people. Doubling down on co-creation, collaboration, collective intelligence, and digital resilience will see us defend our cherished shared values and free the future together. Friends, I am genuinely grateful for your time today, and I wish you the most impactful and successful of festivals. Live long and prosper. Mr. Tang, uh, welcome. Uh, it is my honor to welcome you in uh, Putsung, Kaushitze, uh, even though only virtually through this uh, hybrid session. But uh, there's actually a quite huge audience here sitting, uh, and they are very interested uh, to hear from your perspective and your ideas. And I think that everybody enjoyed the last reference to Star Trek you made in your pre-recorded session. It really uh, made people, yeah, I think, laugh and giggle here in the room. So uh, I think there's a lot of geeks with us uh, who, who really appreciate that. And um, I would start our discussion with uh, 
maybe focusing on the main topics that I think are uniting the, not, not only Slovakia and Taiwan, but uh, I think the whole world that is connected uh, not only via internet, but also with all the negative and positive phenomena that are being brought by this technology we are using for so many decades now. And uh, my question would be connected to um, maybe discussing the perception of what is uh, the state of political culture in Taiwan and how it is connected to the quality of public discussion that you have in Taiwan and maybe uh, show us like what are the um, well what is the good practice uh, in Taiwan that can uh, maybe give us a guidance like how to improve that uh, political culture and debate in Slovakia because honestly I think that in Slovakia we are uh, recently in recent years I would say struggling with having a lot of, uh, I would say, hate speech or maybe polarizing speech that is often presented by those who should be the most, uh, I would say, uh, responsible, the politicians, the public leaders. So what's your take on this? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, really an honor uh, to be here virtually. Uh, and I especially like your framing uh, in having this polarization uh, of extreme views uh, being the main threat against democracy. It is not left versus right, it is not liberal versus social, but rather the uh, amplification of the extremes, uh, so to make people uh, difficult to collaborate across diversity. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, we have witnessed that because uh, in 1996, when we first had our first direct presidential election, the World Web is already there, uh, and a lot of campaigning happened online. So some of those dynamic was already present back in 1996. Uh, and we went through this period of extreme polarization, I believe, because we do have this incredibly neutral places online that are run by institutions that people trust to be nonpartisan uh, and so uh, not influenced by shareholders or uh, advertisers. For example, PTT, which would be Taiwan's equivalent to Reddit, has been for the past 26 years open source, run by students in the National Taiwan University and enjoy academic freedom of speech and so on. And if you go to PTT, which many journalists do, um, you can see easily that the upvotes and the downvotes and so on is based on the societal impact that those ideas have instead of the arbitrary advertisement field, so-called engagement. It doesn't employ any algorithm that amplifies the uh, polarization, but rather it amplifies the pro-sociality, uh, the kind of um, ideas that can bring people together despite their ideological differences. Uh, we also have our National Academy and uh, many other places uh, where there's uh, this credibly neutral institutional support for the digital public spaces. I myself publish all the interviews I have with journalists, with all the lobbyist visits, uh, even my mostly ministerial meetings, everything on this shared neutral place under the Creative Commons so that investigative journalists can have the context of the why and what and the how of policy making, not just the result of policies. So a long-standing culture committing to the commons by credibly neutral institutions in the society, not captured by surveillance capitalism, I believe is very important. Thank you. And by the uh, things you just explained, I think this pretty much gives us a recipe that such global phenomena uh, can actually be uh, tamed down by creating platforms that are decentralized and are more, more locally based. Because uh, as you were saying, uh, they are often managed and uh, well, uh, gatekept, I would say, by, by local citizens who are like uh, professionalized in, in what they are doing. But uh, to be honest, in a small country like Slovakia, we are more uh, dependent on uh, global technologies or, or global platforms, like the one that are being run by Meta, like Facebook, or the one uh, created by Google, like YouTube. And there I see far less 
uh, of credible or responsible approach and make based on that that uh, the people who are responsible for those platforms are not really connected with those communities as it is in Taiwan. But that's just my uh, take on what you just described. Um, but I think that this pretty much uh, gives us a floor to connect this to a phenomena, which are disinformation. And I honestly have a very, uh, well, I would say, uh, personal um, connection to dealing with disinformation in Slovakia. And honestly, I'm not very familiar with the situation uh, in Taiwan. But I see that uh, you might be in a very similar situation uh, than us because you also have a very uh, strong opposing forces, uh, I would say, next door, same like Slovakia, same like uh, other European countries. But even though they are uh, not coming from the east, they are coming from a from, from Western uh, neighbor. So how is Taiwan fighting disinformation or foreign propaganda? And what's your take on, uh, well, effective public communication or even strategic communication? Thank you, that's a great question. Uh, indeed, uh, according to VDEM and other international studies, we've been for the past almost a decade uh, the top um, target for foreign interference, especially around elections in the form of disinformation. Uh, but in Taiwan, I believe we successfully counter it without any takedowns, any top-down censorship, which is uh, what tells us apart from pretty much every uh, other nearby um, southeastern jurisdiction. And this is important because we believe that the vaccines of the mind, the antibodies of the mind, can only be produced if the citizens have the freedom to associate in the process of fact-checking. That is to say, it is not the products of journalism, the checked facts, that uh, protects people against disinformation. It's the act of going through fact-checking that protects a mind against foreign propaganda and disinformation. And to that end, uh, in the basic education curriculum since 2019, uh, we switched all the literacy classes like uh, media literacy, digital literacy into competence classes. Literacy is when you consume, competence is when you produce. So when middle schoolers can fact check our three presidential candidates as they're having a real-time forum or debate. And if they spot any problems uh, with any of the candidates, their name may appear on national level uh, streaming TV, uh, or they contribute uh, to measure the air quality in their school and also in their balcony and so on to a distributed ledger so that they can meaningfully inform uh, whether their parents go to hiking and so on uh, based on the air pollution level they're contributing and so on. So when everybody can contribute into the fact-finding processes, uh, when they receive the disinformation, they would not blindly uh, press share or retweet and so on because they would then tap into the collaborative fact-checking community that everyone is now then a part of. And young children influence their parents, influence their grandparents, and indeed uh, a favorite pastime really uh, is just like reporting incoming email as spam. Uh, many people uh, it re report incoming messages uh, in the chat groups and so on as scam. And that uh, will let us have this dashboard of what is the most trending disinformation without sacrificing end-to-end -end encryption, because this is voluntarily donated by people who receive such disinformation. And then um, professional comedians uh, and communication experts and so on uh, can then engage those top trending uh, like uh, virus variants uh, with viral vaccine that combines a clarification with a very engaging narrative uh, like satire or fun or things like that. So I think a robust information ecosystem need to have citizen participation in the act of fact checking and it combines with the radical transparency from the government that ensures that the fact checkers have the real time information on the entire context as it happens. Amazing. And I, I think the more I uh, listen to what you are saying about Taiwan and how it fights this information, uh, I feel the more we can actually gather from your country as a good practice. 
because honestly, um, I think that, or from my pers personal uh, views and uh, beliefs, I really believe that uh, a society, if it wants to remain free, it is the citizens who should be standing behind the freedom through their action and maturity of that action. And as you described, even being online and uh, well, being uh, a positive engager, being responsible, might be the key how to contribute to a uh, even better online space. Uh, I think that in Slovakia we have a good shot at that uh, as well. Maybe a long way uh, ahead of us because well. Um, more than 50% uh, of our population, for instance, believes in conspirational theories. But I think those are things that can be uh, fixed and improved over time. And in a way, this is also a part of the legacy because uh, we were for a long time, I would say, a border, borderline state that is between the at East and the West. And that maybe opens up a place for another question which is uh, if you are situated in a region with such a strong influence, in, in your particular case, it's coming from China, which is uh, a communist regime with a very different view and culture of how to, uh, well, execute power, how to form society. And we in Slovakia are a strong democracy that has been until, well, not less than uh, 40 years ago in a, in a grip of a, un, another communist power, uh, but the, the, uh, at the time coming from uh, Soviet Union, now uh, Russian Federation. Uh, what is your uh, maybe recipe or approach to remain independent and maybe even vigilant to all the uh, challenges that are coming because of the presence of such strong yet different neighbor? Yeah, uh, I think. Uh, in the Taiwanese parliament, all the four major parties uh, believe that deepening our democracy and also uh, linking us to the democracy network worldwide uh, is the most important thing. That's like the only two things they managed to agree. <laughs> uh, everything else, right? Uh, they have different positions, but deepening democracy and connecting to democratic friends, that is not uh, disputed. Uh, and so I think democracy has this great character in that it builds networks, especially online, because in the digital realm, neighbors is not defined by the physical distance between us, but rather the values between us, the more common values we share, such as liberty and rule of law and so on, the more close we are, the more proximity we feel. Uh, and we can actually very easily, just like now, uh, just connect to each other. Uh, and so this form of solidarity, I believe, is what uh, steals uh, our main uh, resolve uh, against authoritarian expansionism. And that said, I believe uh, plurality, which I highlighted in my speech, is the other uh, half of the coin. Because you see, Taiwan has 20 national languages, 16 of which indigenous, uh, Australian nation, uh, and also the other, including Taiwanese sign language, um, Dai Yi and Hakka and so on. So they all come from very different traditions. We're never going to um, have one dominant voice uh, in ideology or in culture. And therefore, the identity of Taiwan is found not in one particular culture, but in a transcultural republic of citizens where we prize ourselves in always managing to find uh, agreements, uh, even when it's very challenging polarizing topics such as marriage equality and so on. We always manage to find uh, the things that we can all live with uh, in a very quick fashion uh, through cooperating across differences. So um, not only deepening democracy by connecting to the democracy network, which is plural, but also unifying in the vision of a democracy, not as a showdown between opposing values, but as a conversation between many, at least 20 diverse values. That is the other uh, ticket uh, to this resolve against authoritarian expansionism. Sounds like uh, there is really something to the saying that the strength comes from uh, plurality. 
So uh, something that is really plural cannot be uh, well conquered uh, in in uh, any 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 way that easily. But uh, I've been looking at uh, maybe another uh, source of the success of uh, Taiwan, and that, that is when I'm looking at the CPI ranking. Uh, Slovakia is currently uh, number 40 uh, uh, globally, and Taiwan is, uh, I think it's uh, position 25, as you were also mentioning in your speech. And in the last 10 years, you have uh, improved your ranking by 10 points. So my question is, uh, was, was it the digitalization uh, in Taiwan that helped achieve that? And if so, uh, how did that uh, happen and how did it uh, improve uh, the overall situation and the ranking? Yeah, uh, interesting you mentioned uh, 10 years, uh, because 10 years ago, uh, if you ask a random person on the street, if you trust the government uh, is ethical and transparent, and the citizen has a meaningful say, the open government, they will be like, uh, you're, you're kidding no one, right? Uh, because uh, back in 2014, uh, the trust in institution in the government is so low. Uh, at one point in 2014, it was below 10%. Uh, and because of that, uh, there was a massive uh, demonstration, a demo, uh, where people really took matters to our own hands. It's called the Sunflower Movement. It's a thoroughly nonviolent Occupy with uh, half a million people on the street and many more online that demands transparency when it comes to, uh, at the time, cross-strait service and trade agreement. Uh, because at the time, um, uh, we were building our new uh, 4G uh, telecommunication, just like 5G today, uh, and there were debates about whether to allow PRC's so-called private sector components uh, in our telecom. And it's not just telecom, but also publishing, uh, culture, uh, any service industry that may be impacted. Uh, by this arrangement. But uh, the legislature uh, did not hold uh, true multi-stakeholder deliberations, but rather just want to, to ram it through. Uh, and so during the three weeks of Occupy, uh, people deliberated on all the aspects of the CSSTA. And we, the civic technologists, built tools so that if you just happen to uh, be around the occupied parliament, you can see a live streaming of what's being deliberated, not just within the occupied parliament, but also in around 12 different places uh, around the parliament. And you can choose like labor or uh, environment or gender or whatever issue that you want to join. And the best thing is that it's all live streamed. Uh, and so live streaming became part of the political landscape around that Occupy. And because of uh, live streaming, nobody went uh, dead or missing. Uh, and after three weeks of convergence, we all settled on a set of very coherent demands, which were then ratified by the head of the parliament. Uh, and so after that, radical transparency became kind of like the national direction. Uh, and uh, in pretty much all of the important meetings, people demand at least, as I mentioned, a radically transparent transcript, uh, not just of the conclusion, but of the process as well. And so this insistence on open data and transparency in the process, not just in the results, I think really changed the culture of Taiwan. And because of digitalization, what used to take um, years or even decades uh, to implement, uh, for example, uh, the real-time transcription of everything everyone said in the meeting uh, is now um, done at almost no cost, right? Uh, Google Meet is doing real-time caption uh, as I speak now, right, uh, in our conversation. Uh, and so because of the lowering cost of digital transformation, it made ethical transparency by default uh, very easy in Taiwan. And so a couple of years of effort after 2014 uh, saw us on the top of the open data index globally, uh, being the most open in our basic data. And then we uh, in instituted uh, real-time open data, open API, open by default procurement, and so on. And that, I believe, uh, also contributed to the race in the CPI ranking. So, so um, one can say that Taiwanese people have grasped the crisis from 10 years ago 
uh, and uh, managed to create a more open system where openness is actually building the strength uh, that helps you to, well, in, in improve your country and the overall state of things. So that's, again, very inspirational. But um, now, uh, as we are talking about openness, I think it's a time to actually uh, open the floor and maybe ask a question uh, from the audience. So if anyone wants to uh, ask anything, uh, Minister Tang, uh, now it's the time. It would be uh, then perfect if you could uh, step in and come closer because uh, I can't really pass you the mic. So. But it seems that uh, we have a bit of a shy audience, which is all right. Uh, so um, I might have a, one last question, and uh, that would be connected to the reality of uh, what you described previously, that uh, you're streaming all the things that are happening around the parliament, that are happening about public policies. Um, I can imagine this happened in Slovakia, but I can't imagine people being interested in uh, seeing those live streams because honestly when i see the political image of uh, what our people uh, people are really uh, looking at in slovakia it's more that they are interested in fake stories that are often more uh, emotional and therefore they are they better at grasping attention of others so what happened or what is so different about Taiwan that uh, you are not really maybe facing that issue i don't know so uh, why is the transparency working in that way uh, in, in, in your case? Well, I think that depends on whether you share the power of setting agenda. If it is the politicians setting the agenda, nobody is interested uh, in listening to the live stream discussions uh, or reading the transcripts uh, and so on. But if it is the citizens setting the agenda, be it from participatory budgeting or presidential hackathon or um, e-petitions uh, or local level referendum all the way to national level referendum, these agenda are set by the people. Uh, just 5,000 people joining in the electronic counter signature can summon a ministerial response, just like a member of the parliament uh, interpellation. And if it concerns multiple ministers, uh, then you can look up uh, the participation officer uh, in Taiwan uh, will hold collaborative meetings uh, based on the petitioner's ideas and so on. And because it engages people younger than 18, some of the most impactful petitions, for example, banning the plastic straws of the takeout of our national drink, the bubble tea, uh, are brought by people as part of their civic class assignment uh, when they're just 16, 17 years old. Uh, the other group who is active is around uh, 60, 70 years old. Uh, and so they're very uh, young and they're very old. Uh, they have more time on their hands. Uh, they care about sustainability and future generations. And if you give them uh, agenda setting power, through, as I mentioned, um, community building, e-petitions, uh, participatory budgeting, all sort of this institutionalized pluralism, uh, then they are very interested in getting all their friends and families to listen to the deliberations because they set the agenda. So crowdsourced agenda setting and institutionalized pluralism is the key to get politics as engaging as it is, because it is a citizen setting the agenda. Thank you, Minister Tang. This was very inspirational, and I'm very grateful for having the chance to do this interview and giving more insight into the politics and situation uh, in Taiwan. Uh, well, I see one raised, or two raised hands, actually. So if you, if you want, you can sure. come closer and uh, ask a question. Um, hello, so uh, I would like to ask, you mentioned that in your parliament there is a strong opinion uh, among the parties on democracy. And so uh, I would say that the situation in Slovakia is, is, is not the same in this respect. And we might also see this influencing the public, uh, the public debate. And we may have the segments of society which is quite... Uh, the, the, alienated, the alienated from 
from democracy. So whether there would be any best practices or any advice on how to bring them back, let's say, or how to deepen our roots in democracy a bit, a bit better. Thank you. Uh, really Thank great you. question. Um, I believe if democracy is just uh, a vote every two years or every four years, uh, in my field, in computer science, uh, we call it high latency and low bandwidth, meaning that each citizen only upload maybe two bits, three bits if it's eight candidates every four years. Uh, and it is so low bandwidth that most people will feel um, that the politics or democracy is no longer relevant to them. This is something that's done to citizens, not something that people work with citizens. So it's maybe for the people, but not with the people. And so uh, my suggestion is simply to increase the bandwidth of democracy. It can take form of very local community level social entrepreneurship. It could be participatory budgeting on a single community or on your school. Uh, it could be all sort of participation that bring the people who don't believe in democracy, nevertheless find it interesting to participate once in a while. Uh, and if you do so continuously, as in Taiwan, we have a citizen's petition uh, pretty much uh, every day that I would like to consider uh, countersigning, then it uh, fosters a culture that brings the people who were previously polarized or distrust the institution to nevertheless trust some of their neighbors to join their cause and effect maybe small but real change uh, in their community, in their vicinity. I hope that uh, addresses your question. Thank you. And I see that uh, there's a, a very happy nodding coming from the person who asked the question. So uh, thank you for that. And one last question, if you if you still have a time. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Jakub, just so you know who you're talking to. <laughs> uh, so uh, I really liked the singular practices and let's say applications we were talking about, uh, mostly about radical transparency and uh, all the, let's say, streaming platforms and participatory budget, budgeting, etc. But uh, the digitalization actually enables us to scale these into full governments and create, inter create integrated systems. And this is uh, uh, what interests me if uh, such a system exists in Taiwan or if uh, it is, let's say, a, a bunch of good practices being connected in some way on an, or another on different uh, different levels differently and if any of the, the if anything would be the answer if you can maybe provide us with uh, let's say uh, good ways or, or what's say literature or, or websites where we can learn about such best or good practices about radical transparency thank you certainly um, so um, GovLab uh, the governance lab uh, maintains, um, that's part of, I think, a NYU, uh, a list of such practices, uh, including crowdsource agenda setting, problem definition, crowd law, uh, and so on. So I encourage you uh, to check out uh, GovLab website, uh, G-O-V-L-A-B. And with that said, uh, there are many uh, like instant solutions that you can just deploy, like uh, Decidim uh, from Barcelona or Council or um, Better Reykjavik uh, and so on uh, around Europe. Uh, you don't have to translate from Mandarin. Uh, there are many systems uh, nearby, but it's uh, never about uh, digital solutionism. All these tools are just that. They're just tools. Uh, and none of the tools work without uh, commitment from both civil society to set the agenda and from the politicians, maybe local level politicians, doesn't matter, uh, to pre-commit to honor the agenda. Uh, it really needs this connection in order for the tools to take effect. Uh, one main lesson I learned in the past 10 years is that the career public service, the people who work in the city halls, uh, in the ministries, 
they are also citizens. They also have passions uh, that they want to initiate uh, and petition and so on. Uh, and if you engage the career public service in such a way that they think outside of their silo and become uh, proposers of presidential hackathon topics and so on, to institutionalize a certain way to build solidarity with especially lower level career public service, then they can be the bridge that connects the civil society on one hand and the higher levels uh, like mayors or uh, ministers uh, together. Uh, and so I would encourage you uh, to think about how to build such a camaraderie, solidarity, so that uh, it's seen by the career public service, those digital tools as a way for them to feel safer about their work because the risk is uh, absorbed by people uh, crowdsourcing uh, to look at all the issues uh, and they don't have to be the only whistleblower. Uh, and also uh, not just safer, but also more convenient. So they would not need to manually sort through uh, like 10,000 letters to the president uh, manually, but rather collective intelligence systems can help moderating them uh, usually uh, crowdsourced survey tools such as polis pol.is is one of those cheap and cheerful tools that you can just introduce and lower uh, the risk and anxiety of career public service i highly encourage you to check out govlab and polis and many other tools and give it a try thank you mr Dan. um I think that uh, we are slowly but surely running out of time. So uh, if, if it's okay, uh, maybe if you'd like to maybe address the audience with a few uh, closing remarks and then we can uh, well, continue with the, uh, the discussion. Yeah, uh, I think uh, whether it is polarization, whether it is the ebbing trust in institutions, um, it's not uh, that you are alone or we are alone. It is a global issue facing democracies. But I do believe that in acute crisis of trust also comes the possibility of systemic change because, as I mentioned, the career public service also don't want uh, to see this happen and they will reach out to the journalists, to the civil society, if only we can approach this with not solutionism, but plurality. So I would like to conclude by quoting uh, my favorite uh, singer-songwriter, uh, Leonard Cohen, the Canadian poet, uh, in his song anthem, uh, he says, and I quote, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack, a crack in everything. And that is how the light gets in. So see the light and be the light. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Tang. That was a very beautiful ending. And I hope that we'll be having a chance to meet again and next time in person. Yeah. All the best to you. All the best to you as well. Live long and prosper.